Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first IADC uh, webinar, safety webinar. Uh, my name is Bert van Kampenhout, and together with uh, Ariane Jager, we will be presenting uh, this uh, webinar. Why are we doing this uh, safety webinar? Well, because uh, safety is very important for the IADC, the International Association of Dredging Companies. And we want to let everybody know how we are realizing uh, safety within his, uh, his members. So what's in it uh, for you? Uh, we want to make you curious about how we uh, make uh, safety, uh, how safety makes competitors work together. Now uh, I leave uh, the word to, uh, to Arjan to introduce us to, to this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Bert. So the topics we're going to be uh, talking about today is, uh, first of all, we will introduce ourselves in more detail. Then we'll talk about the EADC Safety Committee and the EADC Health and Safety Charter. Then what, will, what is driving safety? Uh, then we'll talk about uh, some specific subjects in more detail, hydrogen sulfide release during dredging, safety in mooring operations, unexploded ordinances, and then we'll talk about sharing knowledge and working alone together. And after that, there will be a question and answer sessions. Okay, as I already told you, my name is uh, Bert van Kampenhout. I work for DEME as a QHSE engineer and prevention officer. Uh, especially uh, for the business unit, DIMCO, in, that's the civil engineering and marine part of, uh, of DEME. Uh, I have um, more than 13 years experience uh, within uh, safety. My focus for safety is uh, especially during uh, work preparation, being proactive and make sure everything is uh, already done before the work starts. Okay, my name is Arjen Jager. I started my career in dredging after I graduated from a Hans Hoger School in dredging engineering and project management in 2000. I started off in an operational role and over the past six years I have become a full-time safety professional. I hold the, the title Chartered Safety Practitioner and uh, I work for Over Nord uh, at the QHSC support desk and my main focus is uh, on operational safety and project support. So. Now we introduce ourselves and uh, we have a poll question um, and maybe you could introduce yourself as well. So whether you are involved in safety professionally. Okay, um, next. Uh, how is uh, the importance of uh, safety within the EADSA uh, realized? Well, in November 2013, a safety committee with uh, safety experts uh, was uh, established. And who is in it? Uh, the four uh, dredging companies, uh, Jan de Nul, there is uh, Mr. Christophe uh, Leroy uh, responsible, Mrs. Ilse Kirjane for DEME, Mr. Jan Willem Ottevanger from uh, Royal Boscalis, Mr. Ton van Minkelis from uh, Van Oort and Mr. René Kolman from uh, the IADC. Uh, I already saw that the poll question is, uh, is filled in. And as we can see, uh, almost 90% is involved within uh, safety. So uh, it's not only us uh, talking about safety, but uh, your background is also safety. So uh, let's hope we can try uh, and learn and share uh, a little bit more because that's the, the goal of uh, our safety committee. Uh, what does the safety committee uh, do? Uh, well, they gather four times a year, and mm, the issues they talk about are all risk uh, issues during dredging, uh, sharing, collaboration, uh, examples of uh, hydrogen sulfide, uh, sulfide the risks uh, about mooring, about incidents, uh, but most important, important uh, sharing the knowledge. A uh, second item that was realized after the safety committee started in 2013 was in 2014 the ARDC realized a health and safety charter. Um, they defined uh, several goals and commitments for their uh, members like uh, safe 
uh, creating a safe and healthy work environment for their employees, comply with uh, all legal uh, and occupational uh, health regulation, uh, keep the risks as minor uh, for their uh, properties, uh, personal and equipment. But I think uh, the most important is striving for uh, zero uh, accidents or to zero incidents. Uh, okay, so dredging operations can be a risky business. Uh, it often involves working with uh, heavy equipment and heavy machines where there are uh, many obvious and also hidden dangers present, and there's little room for errors as the potential consequences can be severe. In addition to these dangers involved with, uh, related to the heavy machinery, uh, dredging operations also involve uh, often working on or over water, uh, but also mooring operations but there are also less visible dangers such as hydrogen sulfide and unexploded ordnances. So over the past years, uh, the safety has evolved within the dredging industry. And uh, nowadays, the safety companies want to be proactive in their safety approach. Also, safety is incorporated in the tender phase throughout the lifespan of a project. The uh, installation of a no blame culture and a stop work authority for all personnel and behavioral programs uh, have been set up over the past few years and have been strongly advocated. An example of the programs that are in place uh, are now displayed. For example, Say Yes to Safety from Van Oort, Imagine Think Act by Jan de Nul, No Incidents, No Accidents from Boscalis and the safety DNA from DEME. All these programs have in common that they emphasize on the behavioral aspects of safety by showing leadership, commitment, taking personal responsibility, also coaching others, stopping unsafe situations. And with the above mentioned uh, commitments, the aim is to um, increase the incidents and accidents to zero. And then we have a good example of uh, collaboration and sharing, and that was the Suez project. Uh, the Suez project uh, was the largest, uh, were the largest vessel, largest number of vessels ever employed uh, for dredging operations, and uh, it, due to the contacts uh, within the safety committee, it was easier to get in contact with uh, our competitors and to share info like, for example, the risks uh, during uh, hydrogen sulfide contact, uh, UXOs and mooring and unmooring operations. Uh, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the hydrogen uh, sulfide in dredging. Uh, there we have a, a second poll question. I'm going to launch it uh, now. Um, what can we say about uh, hydrogen sulfide? Well, uh, it's composed by organic material that, uh, that can be vegetal, uh, animal, uh, or, or else, and it's released uh, within the, the mixture during, during uh, dredging. Um, what are the characteristics of hydrogen sulfide? Uh, well, it's highly toxic. Uh, I have to close the, I can see that already, but everyone is uh, answering so I, and I can now close the, the poll question I see uh, there is a variety of, uh, of answers already but what are the characteristics and uh, what is uh, in fact the, the right answer we can see on the slide that the uh, that it's heavier than air and it's not lighter than air and that's uh, that's also a great risk during uh, dredging because uh, it stays on the ship and it can enter uh, the lower part of uh, of the vessel during uh, during dredging during during dredging. Excuse me. Um, so that's why it's very important to make sure accommodation is closed and uh, all other openings during uh, dredging are closed. 
Some other characteristics are, uh, is, is it that's very reactive and corrosive, and that we can see on the picture uh, on your right side. Um, a tube is very uh, uh, corrosion uh, already, uh, and we can also see that uh, for engines, for example, when the air intake with hydrogen sulfide enters the engine, then we get a lot of corrosion uh, inside the engine. So uh, for uh, the lifeability of an engine, it's, uh, it's not that good. The same also for the electrical system. Um, there we can uh, have some fires after uh, corrosion of the electrical uh, system. What about the uh, exposure and the danger of the exposure? We have uh, a long-term exposure with a low level uh, exposure or, or limit to the hydrogen sulfide and that can cause uh, fatigue, uh, loss of appetite, headaches, irritability, uh, poor memory, dizziness, uh, small, uh, small injuries, uh, small, uh, small incidents. Uh, but uh, in fact when you have uh, the short term and the high level exposure then it can be uh, very dangerous and very serious because uh, it's uh, attacking your nerve system and your breathing system and can cause uh, immediately uh, death of uh, the victim that gets in contact with the hydrogen sulfide. What can we do about uh, of what can we do for prevention and uh, making sure the limiting we are limiting the hydrogen sulfide release during the dredging projects? Uh, we can there work with uh, a closed hopper, also under pressure, and with uh, degasser. We can work uh, by covering the, the open hopper, so all hydrogen uh, air stays under the under the cover. Uh, then we have to make sure we have enough inlets and outlets, and there is an under pressure uh, realized under the cover. And then uh, the third thing we can do is limiting the turbulence uh, in the hopper. Uh, limiting the turbulence uh, can be realized by uh, placing the, the height, uh, the dropping height uh, underwater and making sure the dropping height is uh, less than, uh, for example, two meters uh, uh, of the bottom of the vessel. What can we do to avoid the hydrogen sulfide to enter the accommodation? Because uh, that's a second danger after working uh, uh, in the open hopper uh, and getting in contact with the hydrogen sulfide. Uh, that is uh, diverting the air intakes of the accommodation. Uh, and as you can see on the picture, when, you, uh, when we put and uh, enlarge some pipes to, uh, to divert uh, the intake, then we can take uh, some air from an area where the hydrogen sulfide is less or even there is no hydrogen uh, sulfide. This we can do in combination by uh, placing filters, uh, the active uh, carbon filters. Then a small part about uh, monitoring and awareness. Uh, monitoring, uh, this can be done by personal detectors. So everyone uh, who has a risk to get in contact with the hydrogen sulfide during the dredging operations has a personal detector. Uh, we had some problems with some personal detectors also during the Suez project and then we had some exchange with some other competitors uh, who were also on site during this project. Uh, we had some exchanges uh, about these uh, personal detectors. So that's, uh, that's one way of sharing and, uh, and helping each other. Second, uh, we can install a fixed detection uh, on the vessel, um, not only on the hopper and the, the open side of the hopper, but also in the accommodation. Uh, this can be a system that is near wireless or uh, with cables uh, that can be installed. And the advantage, the advantage of this system is that uh, it can be read from the bridge so all detectors uh, are registered in the, in the bridge. And if there is a problem, the bridge can immediately take some action. And uh, for the third part, we have uh, data logging. Uh, that is a logging uh, that can be during a week to evaluate uh, different situations and different areas to make sure uh, 
which uh, limits are reached or not reached uh, during uh, the dredging part. And then, of course, uh, not only the monitoring is important, but also uh, Ariane already talked about the awareness programs and the behavior programs. Uh, the awareness has to be there within the crew, so they have to be trained to take uh, all preventive measures, including uh, like the use of uh, personal uh, detectors, personal protective uh, equipment like uh, independent breathing uh, equipment. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what's very important uh, within also the, the knowledge of the emergency uh, procedure. And then Arian uh, will introduce you some more about uh, another subject, uh, the safety and mooring. Okay, I will talk about safety and mooring. Um, Pat is going to launch a uh, poll question now. Um, safety and mooring is a very relevant topic, uh, since it frequently happens when vessels have to come alongside, for example, split barges being moored along uh, a grab dredge uh, during the loading operation. In this part, we will draw from various publications such as Terat Aqua and um, also uh, present uh, publications that are available from the maritime authorities and ship owner associations. And although the um, merchant uh, shipping mooring is slightly different as it has a lower frequency and usually is vessel to key mooring, um, still as the types of equipment and the type of um, activities associated with it and the dynamics of these activities are very similar, we can still draw a lot of useful lessons from the um, merchant, uh, merchant marine. So with regards to uh, mooring lines, uh, the question was uh, what was the highest risk when mooring? And I'll uh, talk a bit more about that now. Uh, the Danish, according to the uh, Danish maritime authorities um, associated with mooring, are parting lines and snapback zones, insufficiently trained crew, and poor supervision. And in general, their uh, conclusion is that um, most of the accidents actually not happened due to one factor, but actually to uh, contributing factors that uh, enhance the effect. So it's uh, about interacting factors. So you can say that these um, are all just as relevant uh, for potential accidents in mooring operations. So in the next section, we'll look at each of these um, potential uh, scenarios for accidents. And we'll start with the uh, parting of lines and uh, snapback zones. So mooring uh, mooring equipment is controlled by international and uh, class regulations with regards to the design and maintenance. However, uh, mooring and hauling uh, poses enormous strain on the mooring equipment and uh, major forces are involved. And according to the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, one of the reasons for parting lines was that a large percentage of the parting mooring lines was either via deterioration uh, due to use or storage wear and tear, uh, but also the environment played a significant factory mooring line uh, failure. So mooring lines should be frequently inspected both on the outside and on the inside for any damages. And should there be any unacceptable damages, the mooring equipment should be discarded immediately. Okay, um, so when a mooring line is under tension, it will stretch to some degree, which will be dependent uh, partially on the composition. So mooring lines made of synthetic, synthetic fiber uh, have a tendency to stretch more. And if a mooring line parts, it will go back to its original length. And uh, by going back to its uh, original length, the force will be released and uh, the mooring line may coil back and thus creating uh, snapback zones. So the snapback zones are the ends where the line may um, be um, as I've released to. And should you stand in uh, one of those snapback zones, 
it can cause serious injury or even death. One of the things with regards to uh, the recoiling of the ropes, um, it is very much depending on how the force is exerted over uh, which rollers, uh, which sheaves the uh, mooring lines um, are running. And as such, uh, minor changes in the configuration can lead to very complex snapback zones. One of the things that is a common practice is uh, painting uh, snapback zones on decks. However, uh, this may give a false sense of security because if a mooring configuration changes, also the snapback zone may be changing. So this should be taken into account and also should be discussed with the crew prior to the uh, mooring operations taking place and it should be part of the uh, risk assessment on board. Another issue that was uh, found as a major cause of uh, the accidents in uh, mooring lines was uh, crew, crew training. For example, lack of knowledge, unclear instructions, uh, insufficient uh, trained crew, or ineffective onboard training. So in order to execute mooring operations safely, all crew should be competent. And of course, it should be noted that uh, there is a theoretical part, which is the training, but also competence, which is part of the practical experience. And especially with a high risk activity as mooring, it is experience that counts. And um, that should also be part of the onboard mooring training to be fully conversant with the situation that is uh, on board. Then another one was supervision and um, very short about it. Uh, when mooring operations are being carried out, the person that has the supervision over these activities should be dedicated uh, for these operations. Uh, also some recent uh, innovations uh, have been uh, become available on the market. Uh, what you see here is a automated mooring system that was deployed by um, Jan de Nul. And uh, it is an example of uh, proper engineering and by using uh, engineering to actually uh, improve the safety on board. Uh, various types of mooring systems are currently uh, utilized, uh, both magnetic and vacuum mooring. Um, the advantages of these systems are that there is a uh, no need for mooring ropes and the personnel involved will be in a passive role where they actually will monitor the mooring system rather than being handling the ropes. But disadvantages to the system are that it's associated with high cost and also increased maintenance. So that was it on mooring and then I'd like to give the word back to Bert uh, on uh, the topic of uh, UXOs. UXOs uh, as uh, unexploded ordinances, uh, as I already told, uh, munitions that uh, did not explode when they were employed and still pose a risk uh, of detonation. Uh, all over the world we can find it um, during our operation. It's a very high risk. Uh, awareness is uh, increasing about the prevalence of the presence of UXOs and uh, extreme safety risk they cause which should and must be taken into account during the preparation of uh, dredging operations. Uh, the same also during the Suez project. Uh, all info was, uh, was shared about uh, the findings of uh, UXOS uh, on place, uh, which kind of risk, which type, uh, how to solve the problem uh, was exchanged. So that's, that's also an example of sharing the knowledge between uh, between the different uh, dredging companies on the same project, if it was in a joint venture or, uh, or standalone. It was, in fact, uh, working, uh, working together. We also, we already found some, uh, some questions and we have, uh, I'm gonna start uh, the last uh, poll question about how many um, Ixos uh, Germans uh, uh, put in uh, our North Sea after World War, World War II. Uh, Maybe you can guess uh, which, how many tons. It's uh, it's quite a lot. Uh, I can see it's uh, 
it's a dividing between uh, C or D, um, but we can tell you it's uh, 1.3 uh, million tons that is uh, that has been dumped in uh, uh, in the sea. Um, more info about uh, the UXOs you can find in uh, the magazine of the IADC, uh, the Terra and Aqua, and later on we will tell you some more about it. But uh, there is a, a great article about the, uh, the about the UXOs. Thank you, Bert. Um, so, as we uh, explained, uh, that by sharing knowledge. We can enhance uh, our safety performance. We can get uh, information from each other and maybe avoid reinventing the wheel. Um, in this uh, presentation, we drew from a lot of Terra at Aqua publications. So hydrogen sulfide, common sense approach, uh, UXO, disposal and awareness, and safety and mooring. I also like to uh, point out that in uh, next Terra at Aqua, um, an article will be published on separating uh, man and machine, so personnel working around heavy equipment and the dangers associated with uh, these operations. And also for um, within the next half year, another safety webinar uh, on uh, will be available via IADC. So please uh, keep yourself posted on the uh, IADC website for more information about this. Then um, we come to a. We want to talk about working together alone. Uh, I think um, Bert and I standing here with Bert being a, a DME uh, employee, I as a Vanort employee. We have been sharing information. We've been working together to talk about safety, which demonstrates actually the goal of working together alone. Sometimes we work alone, but still. We are competitors, but by sharing information and knowledge, uh, we can improve our system and we can improve ourselves. So the conclusion that uh, is safety committee uh, comprises individuals with uh, responsibility for health and safety and uh, information is shared through the IADC website and the various publication. And uh, please, uh, you can register yourself on the IADC website to receive the Terra at Aqua uh, regularly on your doormat as a free, pu free publication, as a service from our uh, International Association of Dredging Contractors. And um, if there's more questions about that, we can answer those uh, later on. Uh, but uh, we want to emphasize the, to all stakeholders, safety is a top priority. And uh, by exchanging information, we can learn from each other and raise the bar. So this was our uh, presentation. Um, thank you all for attending. We um, are uh, ready to uh, answer some questions. So um, our uh, mediator is now uh, sending us um, some questions and uh, Bert, you want to kick off with the yeah, first one? Yeah, I will uh, take the first uh, for my account. The first question is, uh, a lot of people ask to get uh, to get the presentation. Well, if you are registered uh, to the seminar, then you can, uh, uh, then you receive a mail with the presentation, with a link to the presentation. Uh, and you can also uh, uh, register for uh, the offline uh, version of the presentation throughout the link on the website. Okay, then um, I see the second question uh, with regards to uh, how to conduct training. I think it's a, a good one. Nowadays with the uh, possibilities to uh, train via internet, uh, there's a lot of improvement because people uh, can do the training in the time available on board. So online training is available, but of course practical training is uh, also still a good way to hand down information. But I think if you distinguish between training and competence, online training is very suitable, but for the competence, you need the practical exercise. So that should not be done online. That is not an e-learning course. That is something that you have to get from experience or from um, people that can share experience with you. We received some other questions. And the third question is, uh, I'm gonna 
review the the chat uh, the chat view. Um, has the approach working together already led to concrete results? I think uh, Arian already told, told uh, the the sharing the knowledge not only during this presentation, but I think this is a good example. Somebody from Van Oort and somebody from Deme, and if you uh, see within the the presentation, you can not only find pictures and good practices of Van Oort or Deme, but also from uh, De Nul and Boscalis. So I think this is one of the perfect examples that uh, safety makes competitors uh, work together. Okay. Um, then the question I saw passing by, I think I already touched on the subject, was about how to get a subscription to Terra Aqua. You can go through the uh, website www iac slash dredging.com and there is an online registration form you can fill in and then uh, you are subscribed to Terra and Aqua and you can receive it uh, free of charge in your mailbox on a regular basis. Um, maybe another one uh, about mooring. Uh, I should read the question. Maybe uh, yeah, maybe you can, uh, can answer the question. Um, where is the question? How efficient is the automatic mooring system in rough weathers? And it's a difficult one. Yeah, it's it's something that I cannot go into detail. I have not enough operational experience. Uh, but what I believe is that the mooring system was deployed in relatively sheltered waters. So I'm not going to make any statements uh, about rough weathers and, and the functionality. Uh, that's outside my comfort zone. Uh, another question, uh, maybe you can start answering it. Is differences in native language from crew an important cause uh, of accidents? Okay. Um, it was not identified as a main cause. However, uh, in publications, uh, it was mentioned that uh, the importance of communication and talking the same language and understanding can be an issue, especially uh, since the crews are very multinational nowadays. As I said, it was not identified as a main cause, but it is an area of concern that should be taken into account um, when working with uh, multinational uh, crews. So yes, it is important, but it was not the direct cause. Meanwhile, we're still reading the questions that are uh, coming in. Uh, I don't think we answered almost all the questions, but uh, we're going to pick pick some other question out. Um, there was one for the hydrogen sulfide uh, question. No mention was made about uh, hydrogen sulfide risks co or controls during uh, dredging with a cutter section, uh, dredger and reclamation area. Any f feedback on this? That's the question. Uh, a lot of feedback you can find in the article. Uh, I'm not also the, the specialist for the hydrogen sulfide. Um, so maybe we, s we shall uh, do some research, research about it and uh, give you some feedback uh, uh, via mail. Okay. Maybe you can shift a bit up. I think we skipped a few questions. Um, there was question number five, whether um, UXOs can be found by survey before dredging operation. The answer is uh, yes, that can be done. Um, magnetometer survey um, can be used to detect metal objects. However, um, this is a very specialist subject and normally um, we, we get the specialist in to do these kind of surveys. But yes, survey can be uh, used to detect UXO at forehand. Okay, thank you, Arian. Uh, we're still reading some some questions. Um, which are the environmental impact of the hydrogen uh, sulfide? Uh, there we have to take care uh, with the release of the hydrogen sulfide in, in the nearest regions. Uh, what is what is in the what is in that uh, part uh, of uh, the region and uh, depending on the, the the limits we are reaching uh, and the dangers, uh, but here also uh, I'll uh, 
I have to take uh, the answer uh, as a question, or maybe uh, Arian, you can uh, fill in uh, some more details about this question. Yeah, it's it's known that uh, hydrogen sulfide is soluble in water, and when hydrogen sulfide is dissolved in water, uh, it can uh, it forms um, sulfuric acid. So uh, the environmental impact may be that it can cause some acidification of the uh, waters around. So that's the envi potential environmental impact. But it's of course depending on how it's being released. Um, so there's a lot of mechanisms involved that make it um, difficult to make a bold statement on how it reacts. That's uh, subject to the execution method at that time of the, uh, of the, the operations. Uh, we are now checking if uh, all questions are answered, but I think uh, I found a question about the UXOs we have uh, answered, and then we have uh, another one. What are the tools to optimize communication when working in a joint venture or consortium? I'm looking to Arion. Uh, I don't know. I think one of the, the tools can be uh, one management system uh, that uh, that is realized within the, the joint venture or the consortium. So there is only one communication, one procedure that is well known uh, within each other uh, that makes uh, uh, good uh, good communication to uh, to the project. Uh, clear definitions of clear procedures, uh, what and and how. I don't know if you want to fill in some more about this question, uh, Ariam. I think you've uh, asked yeah. it. Uh... I think the management system is uh, the base for uh, for a good communication. Uh, we had some final question, but uh, I don't know. It's by by my mind. The question is, what is the limit? Uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide is mortal. I'm going to try to find it in my notes, but I'm not sure we're having it. Um, there is one uh, rule you can uh, you can remember, and that's the 50 ppm uh, rule. Everything under 50 ppm is uh, you can be hospitalized uh, or in observation, uh, and it's uh, defined as a small accident. Everything above the 50 uh, ppm is uh, is highly uh, dangerous uh, and can cause uh, can cause uh, that. But uh, for those details, you can also find in the article of the hydrogen sulfide in the Terra and Aqua on the website. And if I uh, may add something on this, um, internationally there's no standard for the uh, allowed uh, parts per million. So if you go from UK to the Netherlands, limits uh, are different uh, per country. Um, so uniformity is absent. And uh, that's also sometimes highly confusing because what is apparently uh, extremely dangerous in the Netherlands is maybe in other parts of the world considered to be acceptable. Then we have, uh, I think this will be the, the last question uh, we can answer. Uh, I'm looking also to you, uh, Arian, to uh, to help me a little bit. Uh, could you please clarify the main sources of the hydrogen uh, sulfide? Okay, so hydrogen sulfide is a product of um, uh, deterioration of plant material, rotting away under anaerobic uh, circumstances. So um, anywhere where you have those situations, uh, you have a potential for H2S release during your dredging. But of course, it's known historically that some areas have a higher uh, presence of hydrogen sulfide. But for example, uh, peat and bogs, uh, but also um, river mouths uh, have a high potential for hydrogen sulfide release during dredging. Okay. Thank you, Arian, for uh, the answers on all the questions. Um, we have a, a last slide, and these are our references. I don't know if you want to add something about uh, the references. Yeah. So these are all um, publications, both from uh, Terra Araqua, EDC, but also external publications from maritime authorities or P&I clubs. 
They're all available uh, free of charge via the internet. So should you want to go into more de detail on uh, certain specific topics, I recommend these as uh, good starting sources. More references are included in this literature. And uh, yes, I think. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, please register, register to the Terra and Aqua, as already a few times said. And uh, afterwards, this presentation, there will be an evaluation form. Please also fill in. Uh, it's a nice feedback for us. Uh, and maybe when there is a next safety webinar, maybe with us or with others, we can uh, take your comments into, uh, into account. So thank you. Thank you, Ariam. Thank you, Beth. Thank and, you, all uh, the uh, people that uh, attended this uh, webinar. And uh, hope to see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye.